Psychology in Seattle. Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. Today I'm going to talk about the TV show Euphoria. It is an HBO show. It just ended its first uh, season. It's only had eight episodes, so it's not that hard to finish. And it's been created by Sam Levinson, and it's starring Zendaya, and it's based on an, an, an Israeli miniseries, a miniseries that was in Israel. Um, but before I get into Euphoria, the TV show, let me introduce the podcast. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I am your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. And in this uh, episode, I'm going to be talking about episode one only, because I've only seen episode one. Um, Again, there's seven more episodes, but I thought I would just talk about what I saw in the first episode. Um, So there will be spoilers on the first episode. So if you're worried about spoilers on the first episode, then uh, don't watch this yet and watch the show. I think it's a pretty enjoyable show to watch. So this show is freaking a lot of people out, particularly parents, and I guess people with um, sensitive sensibilities, shall we say. There's a lot of graphic sex in the TV show, and people are really focusing on this a lot, particularly a lot of uh, nudity of men is pretty prominent in the TV show, which or at least on an equal level to the nudity of women and therefore um, notable, I suppose, to people. And a lot of people are kind of freaking out about that. Um, It's definitely different from your typical show. And if you're triggered by uh, graphic sex scenes or even sexual assault scenes, then I'd be very careful around the show. But there's there's a fair amount of it. Again, I've only seen the first episode. I suspect that Euphoria is like other shows in that they have a lot of the shocking elements in the first episode, and then they kind of cool down over time. But in the first episode, there's just a lot of it. There's also a lot of drug use in the first episode, which can be shocking for some people to see, especially for a young person in high school using all these drugs. Um, so a lot of people are – there's a sort of a backlash, sort of like a 13 Reasons – backlash, if you remember that. The creators are defending themselves by saying that this is an accurate depiction of teen life today. And so people are asking me, you know, is this accurate? Is this, an, is this actually an accurate depiction of, of what it's like for teenagers today? So let's look into it. So the first element of this show that some people might be surprised and distressed about are you know, the question of, wait, so are teenagers being sexually abused and sexually harassed the way that these kids are being treated in this show? And the answer is, yeah, uh, most teens of, of all genders experience sexual harassment at school and in society, uh, particularly girls and particularly queer people. Uh, but boys definitely experience sexual assault, sexual harassment, sexual abuse, sexual you know, terribleness and trauma as well. It's, it's hard to watch in a TV show, um, but it happens. And, um, you know, we have to wonder uh, about why we're so uh, willing to watch murders and serial killer movies. And when it comes to depictions like this, we, you know, we get upset about it. Um, and this sort of thing has been happening Um, probably since the beginning of our species, or at least the beginning of of our society anyway. Um, It's really tragic that these sorts of sexual harassment, sexual assault happens. Um, I remember when I was a teenager in the 80s, there was a lot of sexual harassment and um, horribleness going on, a lot of sexual shaming among children, because there's there's a fair amount of that among the children, among the teenage kids. there's, There's a lot of sexual harm going back and forth. And as in the 80s, still today, there's just an extreme lack of awareness in our society and among teenagers about this issue. I suspect that teenagers today are, are a little bit more aware, but not to the extent that they need to be. Also, and, and, and so because of that lack of awareness, you'll see a lot of teenagers will do things that they, they're just not aware are things that you're not supposed to do. And, and the impact that they will have on other people. 
There's also among teenagers a lack of adult morals and empathy for others because they're not adults yet and in general on average. And also there's a lot of anonymity at these large schools. A lot of the high schools are really large. You'll have a thousand plus kids. And in these anonymous environments, it um, breeds a, a certain mentality among the kids that is just like, well, um, when I'm not really connected to that person so I can treat them that person like crap, or when you are being harassed, you just feel like, well, I'm just another number here. Whereas if you went to a school of, say, 100 people and one kid was sexually harassing another kid, there there'd be, I would imagine, to be a higher likelihood that it'll be noticed, it'll be dealt with, but uh, obviously not always. Um, so, the you know, when people are freaking out about the the sexual, the graphic nature of the sex, the particular acts that the teenagers are engaging in, the harassment that a lot of the kids are suffering. Um, if you're asking, does that happen? Yes, that absolutely does happen. Uh, I would imagine that of anything depicted in this TV show, that uh, the sexual things are, are probably uh, the most accurate in some ways. Um, again, I've only seen the first episode. The other thing that people are freaking out about is the amount of drug use that's happening in in this show. And they're wondering, wait, so are teenagers actually doing this sort of thing? Or, or is this what kids are like now using all these drugs? And so let's look into that. Most kids, most teenagers use some form of a substance, whether it be alcohol or weed, which are it's extremely common for teenagers to use. But we also have to include nicotine, caffeine. These are also drugs. Um, you know, you know, fewer side effects or fewer social side effects, shall we say, from them, but definitely drugs. A lot of kids will uh, abuse prescription ADHD meds, you know, psychostimulants, uh, prescription opioids, for sure cough medicine. It's very common for kids to abuse these substances or, or use them, however you want to look at it. Um, less common, but definitely present. You have LSD, you have shrooms, MDMA, molly, synthetic drugs, synthetic pot, that kind of thing. Various forms of speed, cocaine, meth, this sort of thing, PCP, heroin, etc. These sorts of drugs are, are, are not, they're not super common, but they're definitely happening. Uh, particularly things like LSD, MDMA, this kind of stuff. Um, but there's a fair amount of cocaine and meth and heroin and PCP happening as well. So um, so a lot of kids are, are using these drugs. A lot of teenagers are just like adults. Um, but, you know, one of the questions that I'm getting is, are, are teenagers using them to the rate that to, to the rate that the main character, Rue, is using them in the TV show because the main character played by Zendaya uses a lot of drugs. She It seems like sh she uses anything that she can get her hands on. And I would say that in every school, there's probably a, in the United States, there's probably a, be about a 3% to 10% uh, rate of drug use that's on the level that Rue exhibits in this TV show. I've treated many kids like this. Um, again, this is just anecdotal. I'm sure there are studies that look into this, but it's hard to study because you have to actually get kids to be honest about this sort of thing. So, but again, I would say about, you know, three, five, seven percent of kids in any given high school are using substances daily and are using lots of different kinds of substances. Definitely a, a big part of life. I think just with marijuana alone, I think that uh, the last statistic I remember seeing something like 5% of teenagers are using every day. And that's just marijuana. So um, there's, a, there's a fair amount of kids, a good, good percentage, it's a small percentage, but a good percentage of kids are using substances every day at school. So uh, there's various reasons for that, which I'll get into later, but um, yeah, it, it happens. Um, and they, the, the show depicts how one's life can spin out of control really quickly. It, it's sort of a hallmark of being a teenager when it comes to drug abuse. They tend to spin out real quick, mostly because they don't have mature ways of evaluating their lives and their behavior. And they don't have the sort of consequences that adults do, like losing a job to uh, make them reevaluate their drug use. So yeah, there, there's there's definitely kids in your community who are using drugs at this rate. It's you know it's pretty common. Um, uh, 
but many kids are not, you know, in fact, uh, many kids don't use substances at all. So there's, there's plenty of kids today, you know, some people swing the other way and they're like, well, all kids, you know, they're all having sex and they're all using drugs. That's not true. Many, many kids uh, never experiment with some substances and wait until they're 22 years old before they have sex. Plenty of kids are like that. Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't have the percentages in front of me, but, you know, a good good percentage. Um, but I would say on average, most kids are using substances um, on an occasional basis. And then you have a small minority, say, 3 to 10 percent who are using substances every day. Um, the regular profile for a teenager is they get drunk occasionally. Occasionally they drink too much and, and vomit or something and have a hangover. They use marijuana maybe once or twice a week. They might sneak a cigarette now and then. And so these are uh, that's the typical teenage life. It's you know pretty pretty common. And for most of the time, for these very typical presentations of teenage drug use, they they don't develop a problem and they don't occur any kind of long term consequences from their use. But some do. Even from this set, shall we say very typical rate of use there can be severe consequences. For example, I had a client once that died from drinking in a very normal way in college. She didn't have a drinking problem in, seemingly. She didn't drink that much and she uh, went to bed and she never woke up. And the um, conclusion medically was that her, she, she just, her alcohol just didn't really agree with her or had a particularly sed you know, sedative effect on her breathing and her heart rate. And and she just, uh, her breathing stopped, her heart stopped, and it's really tragic. So it's not like casual use doesn't have its consequences. It does. It can. Um, you know, more common are drunk driving or teen pregnancy or STIs or um, uh, feeling sick, uh, your, uh, your grades going down, this kind of thing. So um, there are plenty of consequences. But, but anyway, um, in summary... Yeah, there are definitely kids like Rue going to the high school near you. And the last thing, you know, people are asking me are is, um, are teens engaging in this sort of sex? You know, are they engaging in um, s sexual lives that are similar to this? And absolutely, uh, many kids are not. Many kids aren't, aren't having sex, but, but many kids are. Uh, in fact, most teens are having sex. And many of the, those kids are having experiences similar to what's in the show, for sure. It's, it's a part of our society that we don't often talk about. And when we see this in a TV show, it kind of stresses us out because we're like, wait, is that happening? And, you know, this leads to our kids not being aware of what could happen when we don't talk about it, when we don't depict it in TV shows. So, um, you know, if maybe this TV show will help by raising awareness about this sort of thing and... Um, so kids can actually take measures to protect themselves. Um, I can't tell you how many people I've treated who are now in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who are still recovering from traumatic sexual experiences that they had in their teen years. And so, you know, it's a thing. Um, all right. So, yeah. So overall, what I'll say is, is that Euphoria is a show that depicts things um, – fairly accurately for a small minority of kids. But some of the things depicted in that show are pretty much universal. The, the sexual harassment, for example, I would suspect that most girls in high school and queer people, maybe even more so, um, and some boys, but to a lesser extent, have experienced sexual exploitation just even in the classroom. Like, Someone will, like in this show, they, they, they depict someone like, you know, showing porn to this one girl, you know, to Zendaya. This guy's like, hey, look at this porn. And then he simulates a blowjob, you know, basically implying that, I don't know, she he wants her to do something to him or something. And Zendaya is like grossed out by it. That's sexual harassment. I mean, if you did that at on the job, for example, or if you did that in front of the... Uh, the girl's parents, that boy would uh, be smacked and potentially prosecuted. It's it's a criminal act to, uh, in some circles, to do such a thing. And those kinds of things are happening all the time in in many high schools. Um, not all. Uh, I, I've worked with some high schools where 
uh, there's really not a lot of that kind of thing because the kids are so focused on their studies. So there's different cultures at different schools, but um, but I would say most people have experienced some form of of that harassment. Now, for some kids, they bounce back. It's just like, well, you know, yeah, that kid's stupid. But for many kids, it's really threatening and, and can really harm their development. So, okay, let's go into Zendaya, or Rue is her character name, in terms of what we see in, regarding her psychology. So let's get into her specifically here. Uh, but first, let's take a break. All right, we're back from the break. As I always say, if you haven't become a patron of the podcast, do so now. It's the way that we know that you like this thing that we're doing. And if you were a patron in the past and um, you're, you're thinking about becoming a patron again, it would be really great if you were. Um, patrons for the podcast are really the only way that we can do what we're doing with this thing. If, it, if people don't become patrons, we can't dedicate the time that we need to do to actually make this uh, podcast worthwhile. For example, with this episode, I have to spend time actually watching the show, which I wouldn't have done otherwise. I have to spend time taking notes. I have to spend time thinking about it. I have to spend time recording it. I have to spend time editing it. And so, you know, it's a lot of time. It's not, it's not just me sitting down and gabbing. There's, there's a fair amount of prep that I have to do for this. And so when people become patrons, it allows me to be able to do that, which allows me to provide content that um, I think is higher quality than I it would otherwise. Okay. So let's get into Zendaya, the actress, her character, Rue. And so she has a pretty complex psychology that they're depicting very quickly in episode one. Now, maybe in future episodes, they go into more detail, but in episode one, they they race through a lot of things. And, and one of the things that they depict is that Rue, as a young child, has obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. She's counting lights at the dinner table. She she can't really move on. She, you know, she's sitting down at the dinner table and her mom is looking at her and the kid is, uh, she's not eating. She's counting the, the light uh, bulbs in the ceiling. And she, she's trying to get done. She needs to count all of them from beginning to end without any interruption. And her mother uh, is like, what are you doing? And keeps stopping her. And she's like, okay. And she goes back one, two. And the mom keeps interrupting. And uh, the mom escalates and being upset because she doesn't really understand what the kid is doing because it, it looks like the kid's being defiant. That's one of the things that is distressing to kids who suffer from conditions like this is at first it can seem like the kid is just being defiant when in reality they're suffering greatly from some form of anxiety and they're um, obsessing on something or compulsive about something um, to uh, survive really is how it feels. And so the kid is prevented by the mom from being able to count all the light bulbs and cries. So we see that. Then we see that the parents take Rue to a psychiatrist psychiatrist rattles off OCD, ADHD, generalized anxiety, and possibly bipolar. And um, uh, so giving her, I guess, a lot of meds for OCD, ADHD, and generalized anxiety. Um, now, what I'll say about this is it's hard to diagnose ADHD when there's a clear case of OCD. Um, you could imagine that it would be hard to focus on things when you are suffering from OCD. So I, that's just a little nitpick <laughs> about that. But anyway, so one of the questions that I had that I will ask here is, how did Rue develop these conditions? Uh, because she says in the TV show, she's like, you know, I wasn't sexually molested, blah, blah, blah. I had good parents. Um, so go figure, why did I develop this? And... Um, now, what I will say is that she was born uh, during 9-11, and anyone who was alive back then remembers that the United States, the, our society, was terrified after 9-11. It was a terrifying event. I, I was, and everyone around me, was positive that this was the beginning of the end of America, or not, not the beginning of the end of the United States, but, well, some people believe that, but beginning of a trend because we were caught with our pants down so badly, so traumatically and so awfully, and with such destruction 
and un, with extremely mundane methods did these terrorists do this to us. It wasn't some, you know, super complicated high tech plot. It was just guys with box cutters that managed to, you know, do this. And so at, right after 9-11, and then right after 9-11, we had the anthrax scare, which was another terrorist act. And it just seemed like, well, this is our life now. Um, how many, in the same way that right now, everyone is walking around going like, well, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll die in a mass shooting. Uh, it seems like a lot of mass shootings are happening, like, you know, lately. That's how we felt about terrorism after 9-11. It was like, well, you know, maybe I'll get killed in some sort of terrorist, um, you know, mass terrorist crime. And it, it, it was a terrifying time. And so the parents were parenting young Ru during this time when uh, their parents were probably very scared of what was happening. I, I don't, they, the writers seem to be implying that that might have affected things for Rue's development. I'm not quite sure, but I could certainly see that happening. Um, in that, like the kid, the parents are a little anxious. Um, they're a little distracted. They can't. They can't give enough attention to Rue. Rue develops anxiety as a result of that, and that manifests as generalized anxiety and OCD, and just general malaise that she kind of um, talks about later. Um, having said that. Plenty of people develop OCD in the midst of what we would consider to be good parenting. But we have to figure out what good parenting means. We, we often classify bad parenting with the obvious things, being abandoned, being sexually abused, being physically abused. But those are just the obvious ones. There are plenty of other ways you can parent a kid that will make them develop uh, or raise the risk of them developing something like OCD or generalized anxiety. And such as there are some parents, they just don't really match up well with the kid. If the kid is, say, introverted and the, the parent is extroverted, that bad match can result in complications in their relationship, which can cause the kid to experience life in such a way that uh, causes them to develop a uh, case of OCD. So certainly that can happen. The other thing is, is even if your parents, if, if all your memories are pretty good, there's a chance that your parents weren't exactly spot on with their attunement and attachment oriented parenting when you were say one year old. Because a lot of parents, they're sort of stumbling their way through it. And so they don't necessarily always know the best thing to do. Um, the other thing is, is how was it experienced by the child? You know, if, if you're a child and you're experiencing perfect parenting, what if you don't really perceive it that way as a child based on various different things? Well, that can you know, lead to perceived mistreatment, which can lead to complications that can lead to OCD. The other thing is, is obviously um, a genetic disposition for OCD or just even a, a genetic um, uh, foundation that epigenetics takes over and actually develops OCD. So it's very possible to develop something like OCD um, without any mistreatment and, and being parented, quote unquote, perfectly. So certainly that can happen. Then, then we see that Rue is prescribed many medications that she takes daily, early childhood. She uh, takes the meds, but she continues to have anxiety and she continues to have panic attacks. In, in class, actually, she had a panic attack in which she passed out. So uh, she even though she's taking this meds, these meds, she's still having these anxiety, panic attack episodes. She seems to be feeling kind of distant from other people. She seems sort of distracted, and so those are continuing. Okay, so then at the age of 11, her father is diagnosed with some sort of terminal illness of some, or some sort of difficulty. And she has, her, she has a really big panic attack, one in which she feels like she can't breathe, she feels like she's going to die, and which makes total sense given her propensity to anxiety and given the fact that she has now learned that her father has a complication that could lead to him dying. And she's taken to the hospital because her anxiety is so high. And she's given Valium for the, you know, this Valium drip, they, they called it, she called it. And the, the way that they describe this, the way that Rue, the way that the writers wrote this scene is beautiful because it's so accurate. And I'm so glad that 
this is included in here. Um, she talks about how she's in the hospital, you know, she's freaking out, and they give her Valium. And for the first time in her life, she she says, you know, this is this is the feeling I've been searching for my entire life. I felt safe in my own head, she says. I felt safe in my own head. So for many people who suffer from addiction, when they uh, – there's, there's some moment like this where they're given some substance and for the first time they're like, whoa, I, I now feel normal. I feel safe. I feel okay. I, f- I don't feel like I'm – constantly running or constantly having to account for things or, you know, I'm, I'm not scared all the time. I'm not sad all the time. I'm not agitated all the time. I take this drug and, oh, I feel, I just feel okay. I just feel normal. Imagine how powerful that would be in your life, that you go your entire life feeling off, upset, scared, not right, um, never safe, and then all you do is you take this little pill or you, you know, you're given this injection or something, you take a drink, whatever it is, and for the first time, it all just goes away and you're okay. Now, most people can relate to this a little bit in that, you know, a lot of people drink to relax and, you know, that first glass of wine, it's like, okay, I can relax now. Well, for most people, they're not suffering to the degree that Rue's character is suffering. So that when they do, you know, when when non-traumatized or people who aren't suffering in the way that Rue is, it's, you know, in the graph of how much suffering, you know, their, their suffering is like a two, and then they have a glass of wine and it goes down to a one. Well, for Rue, she was suffering like an eight all the time. You know, on the graph of suffering, it's between seven, eight, and nine all the time. And good days, she's like a six. But then she takes Valium and boom, she's a one. And for the first time in her life, she just, she just feels okay. And this is when people's addictions begin is they learn, well, how do I get back there? You know, the drug wears off and the anxiety comes back and they think, well, how do I get there? How do I get back there? And now, some of these people actually turn to, you know, psychopharmacology and turn to psychiatry as, and sometimes they actually do get that relief, but many people don't. And so they look for other ways like self-medication through alcohol, marijuana, opioids, um, you know, abusing benzodiazepines, this kind of thing. So then uh, her dad passes away probably after many years of suffering, which is traumatic for people. So I'm guessing this compounded her issues. And then we see her as a teen in the show. So they go through this really quickly. And we see her stealing her mother's benzodiazepines. That's what it appears anyway. It's unclear why she feels like she has to steal her her mom's benzos because it's unclear why um, she wasn't given benzodiazepines herself or she wasn't given um, anti-anxiety medication herself. I, I'm not really quite sure what's happening um, in that situation. Maybe in later episodes they just, they um, they describe that. Also, as a teenager, we see her going through different school shooter drills, which can be contribute to one's anxiety and, and a feeling of disillusionment with life. We also see boys sexually harassing her, like I was talking about. And we see that she's disconnected from the world and no one's really helping her. No one's paying attention. No one, no one really knows what's happening. So she's isolated. She's anxious. Her, her, the meaning of her life is somewhat in question. Her, her, she's suffering from grief given that her father passed away. Um, She's dealing with these harassments, things at, at school. There's just a lot of different things happening for her. Then they depict what I call and what some people call poly drug addiction. Um, this is where, you know, for a lot of times when people talk about addiction, you know, where people focus on like, okay, what's the drug of choice, right? It's like alcohol or pot or heroin or something. And certainly there are people like that. But there's another class of people who they're not addicted per se to any particular drug. They're, they're addicted to substances in general, and they will take whatever they can get their hands on. It's kind of weird, right? It's like, you know, 
the, these sort of people can get by with taking acid for a couple of weeks. And then when the acid runs out, then they drink for a couple of weeks. And then when that runs out, they take heroin for a couple of weeks. Now, when it comes to things like heroin and meth, those things tend to stick around because they're extremely habit forming. But I hope you get my idea. The creator, Sam Levinson, suffered from a similar pattern, pattern of addiction when he was a teenager, which uh, probably led to the credibility of the writing. And so I thought that they wrote this style of poly drug addiction really well. Um, and by the way, you know, all the things I'm describing so far happened in the first episode. So we, you know, all these different background information, it's very, moves at a very fast pace. It, it's the style of the show, the editing and the directing, and the writing is, um, is pretty good in that way. It, it moves very fast. We see that as a teenager, the character Rue is suffering pretty deeply for, for many years. Um, they show her taking all sorts of substances, alcohol, pot, forms of psychedelics, opioids, what looks like maybe cocaine, not quite sure, what looks to be cough syrup, um, which unsure, and she's definitely taking benzos non-prescription as well. Um, but the other thing is, is they show her having a somewhat normal life on the surface. She goes to school. She's not completely out of control. This is very common. You know, a lot of people think of drug addiction and a lot of depictions of drug addiction for teens and adults. They tend to show a, a certain type of drug addiction behavior where their life quickly spins out of control. But for Rue's situation, we see that she's still going to school. She's able to trick her parents or her mom. Uh, she has friends like her life isn't a complete shambles. And that that's what it's like for most people suffering from addiction. Their their life just kind of goes on. I, I'll never forget. So for a while, I, I treated uh, like a percentage of my practice. I treated a lot of people with opioid addiction. I was the you know, they, they got treatment for their addiction. And I was a therapist who was an adjunct to the chemical dependency treatment. And I was astounded at how well people could keep their life going in a very functional way while being addicted to Percocet or heroin or other kinds of opioids. Because I was under the impression that once you, you know, start using heroin, your life just starts to fall apart. And because that's how it is in the movies, right? You're, you're in some drug house and you're stealing car stereos and all that kind of stuff. And certainly that can happen. But for the vast majority of people, that's, that's not what happens. They keep their jobs. They keep their friends, their family never knows. In fact, sometimes their their spouses don't even know. So it's possible to be able to keep your life in order like that. And they show that pretty well with Rue, although her life spins out of control. Sometimes um, we see that her life isn't in complete shambles, even though she's using all these substances. We also see a scene, a flashback scene in which Rue had overdosed and she's found by her sister. I thought that was pretty interesting. We see that uh, Rue goes to treatment, uh, what looks to be AA meetings and inpatient treatment for her chemical dependency. It seems like she's being forced to go and she's not really into it, uh, which is, again, pretty accurate for a lot of teenagers being forced to go to these things. Um, it's just a heartbreaking thing to watch. You know, if your kid suffers from addiction and you're watching it happen and, you know, they're not really on board with being sober, what do you do? Uh, you know, you can you force them to go to inpatient and you hope that the inpatient will get them clean and get them to have the right attitude. But a lot of kids emerge from inpatient going like, okay, that was fun, right back to use. It, it's just a really hard thing to combat as a, as a parent, really, really hard. And I've, I've been with families through that, through that process. It's, it's rough. You know, it's the same as if you had a spouse that was using substances. It's like, we don't really have control over other people in that way. And so if they're determined to hold on to their substance use, then there's not a lot other people can do. We show, uh, we see conflict between the mom and Rue. I thought this was depicted pretty well. Um, you know, kids take on this very, I don't care attitude because they want to act like they don't care, even though they do care deeply. It protects them from, from things. We see a pretty accurate depiction of a UA or a urinalysis test that the mom gives by um, asking her daughter to pee in a cup, and then she uses this test to see if there's any uh, drugs in her system. We see a pretty good depiction of how uh, kids will fake their UAs. 
um, you know, she rattles through the different ways one can fake a UA by taking niacin and tons of water, which I've definitely seen kids do before, or uh, buying urine online or uh, getting urine from a friend, which is also something you'll see a lot of people do. Um, the problem is, is once the urine comes out of the body, it starts to cool down uh, from body temperature to room temperature, and the test actually tests for temperature to make sure that it just came out of the body. And so you have to you have to warm it up with your own body temperature or some other method. Um, also, the mom is in the bathroom with her, so she has to strap the the pee to her leg, and um, so it's a very accurate depiction. Uh, for the most part, of how teenagers will use all sorts of ways to get clean UA tests. Um, you wouldn't believe the lengths that people will go through uh, because it, they're, they're, you know, they're in a situation where they're being monitored by somebody, either by the courts or their parents or something, <clears throat> and they're suffering, and they believe that their substance use is the only way that they can cope. And so... Um, they're in a bind, you know. <clears throat> they can either um, be honest with their with their authorities and risk having their only coping me mechanism taken away from them, or they can figure out a way to lie. And so, a lot of people will will do that. We also see a depiction of how Rue used to have some friends, or has changed her friends as she's gone into a life of using. This is very common for people to do. It's one of the hallmarks of kids suffering from things, including addiction, is that they'll have a, a shift in their friend group. Not always, obviously, but we see that with Rue in that she has a friend that she had a really good friend when she was growing up, but she's no longer friends with her, presumably because the friend doesn't use substances in the way that she does. So those are the things that I can talk about in terms of the psychology of the show. Now let's just go into my general review of the first episode. So let's talk about what I liked. Well, the first thing that I'll say that I liked and immediately recognize is a lot of brown people, a lot of non-white people, certainly a lot of white people, but a lot of non-white people, which is just great to see. Um, again, reflects reality in that way. We also see, this is a little bit of a spoiler if you haven't seen the show, is that we see a depiction of a trans character, and it looks like this trans woman, this trans girl, she's a trans woman actress, um, but she's depicting a trans teen. And uh, it looks like um, a wonderful depiction of a trans person's life and the, the tragedy that a lot of trans lives can be. Obviously, to be trans doesn't necessarily mean that your life is a tragedy, but because of the way society treats trans people, the way parents treat trans people, the way a high school would treat a trans person, it uh, is common for trans people to suffer. One of my very first clients, uh, probably my second client I ever treated was a trans woman. And I didn't work with her for very long, but the, um, the, the amount of chaos that was in her life and the amount of suffering that she had experienced over years and years was was just so present. I I, th I remember one session where she basically just cried the entire session while I listened. It was um, an eye opener to see the way people treat others, uh, particularly trans people, particularly queer people, and the privilege I have as a man who's heterosexual, you know, and and doesn't have to go through that. Um. So so yeah, they. They show. They also showed, and I don't know. Again, I don't know where this is going in the show, but they show how trans kids often turn to self-destructive acts. It's actually quite common for trans kids and young adults to become self-destructive in some way. Obviously, not all trans people are like that, but, and certainly a lot of um, you know non a lot of cisgender people can be self-destructive as well. But um, but because the way society and their families uh, treat trans people, they are made to feel like they're, they're worthless and they're worthy of abuse. Also, some trans people are searching for validation that they are worthy as their gender, and so they'll engage in risky sex acts to validate the fact that they are the gender that they, that they are, um, and, and because they're not getting the support in other venues, and so they might turn to risky sex or you know hookups to somehow validate who they are as a as a person, and they often will turn to substances to cope with the sheer amount of pain in, in their life. 
because of the way society is treating them. And it seems that in this show, they're depicting that uh, pretty well as well. The music is amazing in this uh, first episode. I, I don't know about the rest of the series, but the the way the music is integrated, I, I don't think I've seen a show recently that does this as well, that they, from, again, I'm not a teenager, so uh, it's been a long time, but I could imagine being a teenager and watching this show and being like, well, they really got the music vibe of this particular type of teenager really well. Um, you know, because a lot of times uh, when we watch TV shows like this, that the musical choices will reflect the music director's tastes, right? You'll have like a, you know, a 33-year-old music director and they love a certain kind of music style. And so the music style will reflect a 33-year-old's music style. Well, this show seemed to reflect a, a much younger, you know, very current music style. Again, it's a particular uh, you know, subsection of American teen culture. Not every teen likes that subsection of music, but I think that it looked accurate to me. I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it wasn't. Um, I like the directing. I thought the directing of the show is pretty good. I like the voiceover. So when a, when a voiceover is done well, so Rue, the main character, she does a lot of voiceover that is, is really cool. You know, if in, um, um, in, uh, uh, oh God! The British show, the Fleabag. In Fleabag, there's a voiceover similar to this, not in the exact same way, but a similar fast-paced voiceover way of telling a story. There's this thing in Hollywood where you're not supposed to have voiceovers because you know this whole thing like show don't tell. They'll say that voiceovers are lazy. Like in adaptation, for example. Um, the advice that the writer, Charlie Kaufman, gets is never have a voiceover, and he includes a voiceover. But anyway, actually, as soon as he gets the major point of voice, then the voiceover stops, which is just, the adaptation is just a, a perfect movie. It's so good. But anyway, there's this notion that voiceovers are lazy and that you should show the drama rather than tell a drama. But when a voiceover is done well, I think it's, it's really... Um, to me, interesting to hear the inner life of the main character. If you didn't have the voiceover, the main character, Rue, would seem kind of boring to me. Having the voiceover gives the sense of Rue's inner life, which might be most of where the interesting things are happening. Anyway, um, they also show the reality of teen life these days, like the obligatoriness of cell phones, et cetera, like this. And um, a lot of TV shows will avoid having cell phones in them, which always kind of boggles me. They, um, as I said earlier, they, de they depict the reality of sexual harassment uh, on teen people in school. You know, they, de they depict the sort of bro culture that some young boys or young men will have. They depicted that pretty well. Um, you know, there's a lot of teenage boys who are taught that in order to be worthy as a young man, they have to deny certain things and they have to be a certain way. And this is what we call toxic ma masculinity. And these things can lead to um, a lot of weird manifestations in society. One of the things being bro culture where teenage boys will get together and, uh, you know, like there's a scene where... I don't know. Ten boys are looking at one of the guy has ta one of the guys has taken pictures, naked pictures of a girl, or somehow he got naked pictures of a girl at school, and they're all looking at the pictures and watching a video of, of him having sex with her or something, and they're all like, "Whoa, cool!" You know, high five. And uh, this is left to their own devices. Teenage boys would not act this way. Uh, teenage boys have. Uh, you know, the normal teen capacity for empathy that other people have, you know, why would they put that aside? Well, because we give so many messages to teen boys that in order for them to be worthy young boys and eventual men, they have to act a certain way. And when you're insecure, like you are when you're a teenager, you fall back on certain things that you think are going to make you seem like you're cool, make you seem like you're confident, make you, make you seem like you're a man. And uh, we have definitely, you know, locker room talk, blah, blah, blah. We've definitely labeled certain behaviors as like a marker. Well, you know, boys will be boys. You know, men are like that. That You know, men are sexual. Men are, you know, they take sex and all this kind of stuff. And 
boys pick up on that. And so, it, you know, it's pretty awful. Now, they also depicted the pressure that people will feel in high school to engage in certain sexual acts. Um, you know, there, there's certain scenes where it's unclear if the young women are um, consenting, so to speak, and really into it, or if they're just doing it to fit in. I, I thought that they depicted that that pretty well. And I think it's better now. I mean, so that's one of the things that I might be able to help people to calm down a little bit on is that the um, landscape for teenagers on average in the United States anyway, I, from my anecdotal experience, it's better now than it was before. It might seem worse because we're hearing about it more because we're actually allowing people to speak their mind more. But um, I would suspect that in the 80s, it was way worse than it is today. We have greater awareness now. We need much more awareness. But um, but think about in the 80s and the 70s, we really didn't have any kind of awareness of this sort of stuff, or very little. And um, one of the things that – one of the markers that we can look to, uh, there's several different markers in the demographics that can point to – the fact that we're we're improving our society for teenagers, like kids are waiting longer to have sex, there's lower teen pregnancy rates, um, there's more tolerance of queer people, this kind of thing. So we seem to be doing a lot of good things in our society to, to move it forward. Um, regarding teen pregnancy rates, for example, they've dropped significantly in the last 30 years. They've dropped to 31% of what they were in 1990. So, you know, just think about that, that in 30 years ago, we had a certain rate of teen pregnancies, and now we just have 31% of those teen pregnancies. That's a really big deal. And we have a, a lot of, we can point to a lot of things that public health, education, therapists, perhaps politicians have done to improve it. parents, um, mentors, you know, we've all done what we can. Now, it's not like being a teen uh, mother is a terrible thing, but a lot of teen pregnancies are unwanted. So, um, so we're doing good there. And they've particularly dropped for African American teens and Hispanic teens. Teens, for example, with black teenagers, it's twenty five percent of what it was thirty years ago. So you had a certain rate of teen pregnancy thirty years ago for African American teens, and now it's one fourth of what it was 30 years ago. That's a big success story, and we should pat ourselves on the back, and we should look to what have we done to affect that change, and what can we learn from that? Um, the show also depicts how, depicts how uh, young ladies, girls are socialized to not necessarily enjoy sex, that they're, they're just sort of objects to have sex with, and they kind of depict that. Pretty, it's, hard, again, hard to watch, but... Um, definitely present in our society. And we have ourselves to blame for that. Um, I also, you know, going on with other things I liked about the show, I really liked her drug dealer friend. Um, this is a character we don't see very often in the media, but it's definitely a character. You know, if you grew up in a particular sort of community, you definitely had a friend like the drug dealer friend. Um, I can't remember his name. He's, he's the main character, but... Um, but this sort of person is not depicted well. Uh, it isn't depicted very often in TV and movies. And when they are depicted, they're depicted as like uncaring, burnout, sort of stupid people. But, you know, in some ways, the drug dealer friend is like one of the most smartest, wisest person people in, in the show. Um, I, I also liked how the show uh, showed that adults were using substances as well. Um, uh, including ma mainly alcohol. They show a lot of the parents drinking alcohol while they're eating dinner or watching TV and how it, this isn't just a, you know, substance use isn't just a teen thing. It's, it's just in our society. In fact, if I remember right, I think uh, statistics show that adults are actually drinking a lot more now than they were 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, it's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, but it does say something about our society and uh, the stress we're under poten potentially and the disconnect that we might be feeling and the lessons that we're giving our kids. If, if we are uh, using a lot of substances to cope, if we're using a lot of substances in a jokey way, like, oh, ha -ha, I got really drunk last night, you know, what kind of message is, is, is that sending to people who are looking up to us? Okay, I'll end with some nitpick things that I didn't like. I, the, 
the biggest thing I didn't like about the first episode, and maybe it'll change throughout the season, is that I kind of walked away not necessarily liking any of the characters. Rue is obviously the the character I'm supposed to care about, but the show was just so nihilistic and chaotic that I didn't have enough time, I thought, to really um, connect with the Rue character in a way that I would be rooting for her. I mean, I'm obviously hoping that Rue's character does well, but I'm also like, you know, she's self-destructing and a lot of this stuff she's doing to herself and she's, she's not, she doesn't seem to be doing anything to better her life in any way. And again, that's normal for people like this to, to do. But in terms of a drama on TV, I, I just felt like I didn't really have any. Um, well, the one character I really was rooting for was the trans kid. Uh, that character I felt like I, I was rooting for, for sure. But again, the first episode was just so chaotic, so fast, so many people, so many elements happening so quickly that I kind of walked away going like, I don't know if I want to watch this show anymore because I, I don't know if I want to experience the onslaught of that chaos and not necessarily see uh, – anything good that happens. Uh, I suspect that the rest of the season is similarly grim. Uh, the, I doubt that the season has some sort of Hollywood happy ending. It, it's just, it's just a guess of mine. And, um, you know, not that I need Hollywood endings, but it just felt a little like a lot of stuff happened in the first episode. It just seemed like, Oh my God, like this is just an onslaught of things. The other thing I didn't like about the show was that sometimes it was, it was a little sensational. Um, you know, I think the creator wanted to have the pilot be chock full of interesting things and just crammed a lot of things in there. It's not a terrible thing, but I thought that was a slight negative. The other thing I didn't like about the first episode and I guess maybe the first season is that the main douchebag, the main douchebag bully kid boy is a football player and I'm a, fo I'm a football player. I was captain of my football team. I loved playing football, and I was never like this. And for some reason in TV and uh, movies, almost always the douchebag is a football player. And I, I just don't – it's just such a trope. Uh, plenty of bullies don't play football. Um, and most people who play football are not bullies. So I don't understand this connection between – football and being a douchebag bully. I just, why is that a connection? You know, or I just don't get it. Why isn't it baseball, you know, or, or volleyball or golf or something? You know, why is it always football? I mean, obviously I have a personal interest in this trope and this stereotype because I'm a, I consider myself a football player. I'm a football fan. And uh, yeah, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> And the other trope that we often see in what I consider to be lazy writing and la lazy character development is that the, t the, the douchebag is friends with uh, this guy who uh, is not like him at all. So the, the, they're, the douchebag has a friend and the douchebag is 100% douchebag and the friend is 100% nice. He's like the nicest soul on the planet but he's sort of wrapped up in a douchebag world. So you have the nice guy and the douchebag and they're friends. And uh, the douchebag's always being a douchebag. And the nice guy's always going like, hey, I think we should respect women. You know, there's this, this very, there's this dialogue happening between the two of them. And it's completely unrealistic. The douchebag would never be friends with a nice guy. And the nice guy would never be friends with the douchebag. <laughs> or at least they wouldn't spend very much time together. Um, and especially if the nice guy is going to poo-poo everything the douchebag is going to say, the douchebag is going to say, go away, you're bugging me. Or the nice guy is going to go like, you're disgusting. I'm going to go hang out with these other nice people. So it's it's this trope that they do where it's just like, I don't understand why those two people are friends because they're completely different. They don't share any values. How are these two people friends? Like they didn't really, but they do that a lot in TV and movies. They want that douchebag, nice guy dynamic, which doesn't make any sense to me. Um Another slight nitpick is that pretty much right away, I was like, none of these actors look like they're high school aged. All of them look like they're young adults. And I looked up their ages, and in fact, they are. Like, most of them are in their early 20s. And this is a very small nitpick, but, you know, I think the movie Eighth Grade actually had eighth graders who played eighth graders. And it was very noticeable. You know, eighth grade kids look like eighth grade kids, if you, if you know eighth grade kids. 
And these kids are supposed to be prime, you know, they're supposed to be all in high school. High school kids, there's a certain look to the way that they look. And there's also a certain look to the way a 21-year-old or a 22-year-old looks. Now, obviously, there, there's going to be some overlap, but but I just wished for realism's sake, because they're really trying to go for a real vibe here, that they would have cast 16, 17-year-olds. Now, it's possible that they didn't do that because the the show is so graphic that they had to use adults. Um, so I could see that maybe, but again, just a total slight little tiny little nitpick. The last nitpick that I'll say is something that I hate about all of Hollywood is that wet streets. Now, if you've listened to this podcast, you've heard me talk about this before. So uh, uh, you might not notice this, but I do that a lot of shows are shot in LA in Hollywood, right? And in that part of the world, it doesn't rain very often. But for whatever reason, directors of photography and directors, they love it when, a, especially at night, when concrete is wet. They want their their sidewalks to be wet. They want their streets to be wet. I, you know, it reflects light better. I think it's more dynamic. Uh, dry concrete and dry asphalt looks kind of dull, I guess. But it's ridiculous because every time they're driving down the street, every time they're in a parking lot, every time they're walking on a sidewalk, everything is just drenched with water. There's like puddles of water. And you look up in the sky in the, in the shot and it's crystal clear. And you look on the tops of cars, there's not a drop. I mean, maybe it's something about living in Seattle where we you know we're reportedly stereotypically it's supposed to be raining all the time. And, and I, I want, if it's, you know, if it did rain, then sure, leave the, the roads wet. You know, that's just what happens. Sometimes in a scene, you know, the, the weather just, it rains. But it's so distracting because it completely pulls me out of the show because it, it's such an obvious marker that this is not real because there's just all this fake water everywhere. The other thing is, is, is California... I think is in a, you know, Southern California is in a perpetual water crisis. Meanwhile, Hollywood is just dumping truckloads of, full, of, of water. I mean, we're talking like, like a mile worth of road and, and um, sidewalk. They're just dumping truckloads of water. And, and <laughs> now I'm sure I, people out there are just like, Kirk, why do you care? Well, that's what my wife says. Because every time this happens, I go, wet streets. And she's like, oh, you with the wet streets. And uh, I don't know, it just bugs me. <laughs> but overall, Euphoria, I think, is a worthy show. I'm looking forward to watching the, the last, uh, you know, the next seven episodes. Um, I think it's an innovative show. I think it's an interesting show. I think it's one of those shows that we're going to be talking about. I think it's one of those shows that a lot of kids and a lot of young people are going to remember years from now. They're going to be like, oh, remember Euphoria? You know. Because it pushes so many boundaries and depicts things. It depicts the now pretty well, I think. But there's also some very universal things. I mean, douchebags have been around forever. Drug use has been around for a long time. Uh, OCD has been around for a long time. A disillusionment among young people has been around for many decades. And so I think that the, the show um, is 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 universal in some ways, but also very specific to today in some other ways. Um, you know, hookups on the phone, uh, trans people being out in their high school. I'm, I don't know if the trans person is out, but um, maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe comes out, not sure. Um, the way that parents are with their kids, it's, 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 it's a pretty good show, and I recommend checking it out. Well, let me know what you think about everything that I said. Do you care about wet streets? Do you think it's an accurate depiction? Do you think the music is accurate among this uh, culture, this particular group of type of kids today? Uh, do you like the acting? Do you like the story? Do you think it's too much? Do you think there's too many penises? That's one of the things that a lot of people are saying. There's too many penises in this show. Um, you know, what do you think? Let me know. Uh, it, click below. There's a link that goes to our website. That's where I like people to contact me through is the contact us page on the website. It, it asks all the questions that I like to ask people before I respond back because it, it just helps me to 
have more context about how to respond back to you. But anyway, thanks for joining me out there. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it.